In this episode, I'm joined by David Engels, who is a historian and philosopher of history. He is also chair for Roman history at the University of Brussels and research professor at the Institute Zohotny. In this episode, we discuss the first volume of Oswald Spengler's The Decline of the West. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you would like to support Emetics and gain access to some exclusive content, please find links in the description below. Enjoy. Okay, so David Engels, thanks very much for joining us on Hermetics Podcast. Thank you very much for the invitation. Looking forward to, to our discussion. Uh, we are going to be discussing uh, in this f first part of two uh, to sort of discuss the, the volumes respectively. We're going to be discussing the work of Oswald Spengler, uh, specifically his sort of magnum opus and most well-known work, The Decline of the West, which is split into volume one, Form and Actuality, and then volume two, Perspectives of World History. Um, and I guess for a lot of people, as this, 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 this first discussion will probably be overviewing the text, you know, maybe a little bit of overview of Spengler, um, and also digging into the first volume, um, for people, I guess, who haven't actually read Decline of the West, the first volume isn't really a like what you'd think it's going to be about in terms of the title and in terms of uh, you think you'll be stepping into this uh, grand, perhaps defensive Western historical vision, which you are to a, to a certain degree, but then the mathematics comes in and certain peculiar traits, which you you don't really expect, at least from my own opinion. Um but before we begin, uh, David, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, what it is you, you do, and I guess um, also, you know, when you first came across the work of Spengler and why it, why it interests you so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with, uh, with pleasure. And first, uh, thank you thank you very much for the opportunity to speak about Spengler. One does not very often have this, this the, the occasion to speak about this uh, philosopher of history who is still very much unknown to to many people. Of course, even of, of course, on the one hand, on the on the continent, but uh, especially so in the Anglo-Saxon world, where people tend to think much more about Arnold Toynbee when they think about cultural parallelism, morphology of history, and uh, and so forth. Even though Spengler was, of course, you could say first, even though he he also uh, uh, used many sources going even back to antiquity, but was certainly one of the main inspirations behind uh, behind Toynbee. Concerning myself, well, uh, I'm a, a Belgian ancient historian, but I did already my my, my studies of history, philosophy, economics uh, uh, in uh, in Aachen in Germany, uh, with uh, the uh, idea in my my, my head to. Um, uh, somehow um, becoming uh, verifying uh, somehow the uh, teachings of uh, of Spengler uh, because I first read about Spengler when I was 17 or so when I read Thomas Mann's uh, Dr. Faustus uh, this very pessimistic book about German history uh, culminating in the catastrophe of the Second World War and already this idea of seeing German history as some form of biological entity with, uh, leading with necessity to, to declare and, and catastrophe and death is, of course, very much Spenglerian. And, of course, uh, Thomas Mann himself more, was extremely interested in, in, in Spengler and had a very ambivalent relationship to Spengler. So I, I learned about Spengler through Thomas Mann, read the uh, Untergang des Abendlandes, the decline of the West, no, 17, 18, something like that. And then when I did my, my studies, I uh, really focused on um, uh, how to verify somehow if these cultural parallelisms uh, put forward by Spengler uh, could be still considered as true or not. And so I did my my, my future or my, my, my further career more and more in the field of ancient history, but uh, went back to uh, a more Spenglerian outlook on uh, on history, which never really left my mind. When I wrote uh, a, a book in 2013 uh, with the title Le Déclin, La crise de l'Union Européenne et la chute de la République Romaine, donc uh, the, the decline, the, uh, uh, the fall of the Roman Republic and the crisis of the European Union, where I tried to show how our present times in the beginning of the 21st century could be put in parallel with the late Roman Republic, so which is, of course, a, a genuinely uh, Spenglerian idea. And since then, well, I'm, I'm publishing uh, uh, quite a lot on Spenglerian subjects, on the uh, uh, parallelisms between civilizations, not only antiquity and, uh, and the West, but also China 
China, India, Egypt, uh, and so forth. And even recently, some years ago, in 2017, I think, uh, founded together uh, with a, a couple of colleagues um, uh, uh, in uh, a uh, Oswald Spengler. Uh, society, which is trying since then to publish a regular journal, to organize conferences, meetings, even to discern also or to award an Oswald Spengler Prize every every two years. So the first one who received it uh, was uh, well back, the well-known French writer. Second one, uh, Walter Scheidel, uh, a contemporary uh, historian, very much at the core of today's uh, cultural parallelism. So that describes quite neatly, I think, uh, my, my interest in Spengler and where my own interest stands. And I have to say, that these interests are not necessarily focused on on Spengler as 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 his particular figure in the history of thought, but rather in his thought itself. So this idea that you can parallelize civilizations and somehow predict, in very general terms, uh, the history to come of those civilizations uh, not yet uh, extinct. And so one of my major problems for many years by now is the writing of uh, a personal universal history on the basis of this uh, uh, parallel uh, approach. And so, of course, my own my own approach is uh, inspired by Spengler, but tends to go in quite a number of different ways, while still, of course, based on this on this fundamental assumption of the parallels between the great civilizations mm -hmm. okay okay is so this this award that you give out is it to do with a specific book of these authors or is it just their general uh their their their, their, their work in general um well that depends a little bit it, it, but it's it's rather it's rather on their on their work in general and of course to the degree um, to which they are related to spengler's thought so it's it's not necessarily about who is the most spenglerian in recent uh, authors but it's it's it, it's rather who in his work be it in its scholarly work be it in his, his novels or, or or whatever or other teachings um somehow uh, captures uh, the the this main spirit of a declining uh, Western civilizations with all its negative as well as positive uh, perspectives that, that that these could have, and so obviously uh, Welbeck, uh, uh, who is somehow the you could say the the epitome of the modern decadence literature, uh, and who is very well aware about this also, and who who um, contextualizes his own position, is of course someone who corresponds quite well to the different patterns uh, that are predicted by, by Spengler. And there is uh, quite a lot of interesting uh, theoretical reflections behind this also uh, in, in, in Welbeck. A uh, couple of uh, papers he also published recently show that. And of course, uh, Soumission, uh, one of his latest novels, speaking about the decline of the West, the takeover of Islamism and so forth, uh, it is of course a very Spenglerian novel. There are many allusions, even though indirect allusions, to 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 Spengler and his thought. And then, of course, Walter Scheidel, as I said, is a, a very um, not not traditional, but I mean very academic uh, a scholar uh, trying to show today uh, the parallels between societies and great civilizations, essentially between ancient China and ancient Rome, and not on the basis of, of textual sources and the personal impressions of these uh, elite historians and philosophers, but rather on the basis of a, a concrete, uh, um, quantifiable, uh, numismatic or archaeological uh, material. So a very, you could say, very academic, very scholarly, a very con concrete approach towards history that nevertheless somehow verifies and finally confirms many of the uh, intuitions uh, Spengler had on these same subject uh, or these same subjects uh, uh, a century ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, and I can't yet speak about the, about the third uh, hour, the, uh, but we already have his confirmation. So next year there should be quite an interesting ceremony about with one of the, I would say, most well-known 
North American intellectuals of uh, of, of 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 our age, so uh, who's also a very also a very determinist and a bit pessimist outlook on on history. So uh, you can be uh, can 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 expect the prize speech with quite a lot of uh, of, of of interest and uh, curiosity. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll try to figure out. I'll try to figure out after the, this chat who, who that is. Um, sure. But before we do, we do. I mean, you've already f- thrown a couple of names in there that may that may come into this question here. Um, before we jump in specifically with the with the decline of the West, um, I have to ask you the hermetics question. You can place three thinkers, living or dead, into a room, and listen in on the conversation. Who do you pick? But as we're talking specifically about Spengler, uh, he's already there, uh, and three more are <laughs> walking in. Yeah, sure. Well. I, I gave also this 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 question a little bit of 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 a thought and um, well as I said as I'm essentially interested in the link somehow uh, in between philosophy metaphysics history um, I think that my, my my three names would be apart from from Spengler obviously uh, uh, Plato mm-hmm. on the one hand because I would really be extremely interested to hear more about what is called his his esoteric teaching that is uh, the uh, 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 his teaching on the first principles which we can just uh, reconstruct on the basis of some allusions in Aristotle and in other texts and which are extremely interesting because they show that uh, there are quite a lot of uh, similarities between Plato's esoteric uh, teachings about the one, the many and what is in between uh, with the uh, Neoplatonician or Neoplatonic thought than with much other elements in classical antiquity. So that that makes Plato appear uh, like uh, or as, as as being much closer to other dialectical and and, and ter- ternarian uh, thinkers such as uh, yes uh, Plotin, Proclus, Damascus, of course, but also like Cusanus or like Hegel than what we thought before. So that was something I, I would be really interested in. Uh, another um, person who I uh, would really like to to have his opinion on. Uh, on to on on the degree on the degree to which uh, modern knowledge about about history confirms or rather uh, um, uh, infirms his own teaching would be Hegel, uh, because once again I'm um, uh, quite interested in he- Hegel's uh, dialectic and think that his uh, dialectical approach towards history is uh, something still very inspiring because he managed uh, quite to the contrary to Spengler by the way to con- combine uh, metaphysics and history, making both the expression of, of, of one superordinate phenomena, which Spengler didn't, didn't really manage or even want, want to. And so I would be quite interested to see what's, what Hegel would think about his own theory in the light of the new discoveries on history, uh, uh, on the many new civilizations that have been found on, on the new interpretations of antiquity, the Middle Ages, and so forth, that quite div- differ and di- diverge from what he knew in his own time, and which I think, I guess, I hope, uh, would perhaps lead him to to change his opinion on the idea that world history in itself is teleological, and perhaps rather um, uh, rather lead him, as it does with me, to think that the the laws of dialectics do not necessarily um, do not necessarily uh, confer, uh, um, apply to to world history, but at least to the histories of civilizations. Mm-hmm. And then the third thinker, of course. Um, and you, you, you may perhaps now, now frown or, or, or laugh, but laugh perhaps because it's not necessarily uh, a, a, a philosophical or historical thinker. Uh, would be Tolkien, uh, who is uh, one of my my favorite authors since since ever you could say, and uh, whom I see uh, not at all as, as as which it isn't of course, but just as fantasy writer like Howard or like many others, but rather like a very deep thinker um, trying to to um, uh, somehow encapsulate in his novels, in his different uh, mythological sketches, uh, quite a lot of uh, very deep uh, Catholic, obviously, uh, uh, thinking about history, about the destiny of man and so forth. And I would really like to to hear him discuss uh, with uh, Spengler, um, as I do not think that Tolkien knew about Spengler. I don't think he ever read him. At least there are no allusions in his correspondence or 
or other texts, but there are quite a lot of similarity. Uh, it's, it's when it comes to his pessimistic outlook, to his vision of different civilizations and ages evolving also in a very circular uh, fashion, uh, but all that, of course, not on the grounds of uh, something like Spengler's uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat basic or, 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 or down to earth uh, vitalism, but rather on the basis of, of, of theo theological considerations. And that could be a very interesting discussion because Spengler was, of course, quite, quite far from any, any theological, uh, uh speculation, uh, whereas, uh, Tolkien, on the other hand, had many, um, similarities with uh, some ideas of, of Spengler's morphology of, of cultures. And so such a crossover could be quite interesting. So that that would in 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 some be uh, be be a nice combination of the philosophy of history, of philosophy of metaphysics, of of theology uh, that could certainly lead to 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 interesting uh, results. So the the importance of that room for you is once again this this parallels of civilization and the, and the evolving of civilizations and basically these yeah. four different thinkers coming together to attend to that and in, in, from different perspectives. That is a bit my own idea fix, uh, I'm afraid. So that is why I see most of, of also of intellectual history uh, in from, from that point of view, because that is something that is, that is very, very important to me and seems still very much underrated from a modern academic point of view, and which I would really like to, to, to promote much more as there is such a, such, such a need also in better understanding our own civilizational position, but also better understanding all these other cultures who for the, which for the first time uh, in world history finally are so open and accessible to, 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 to us. So if there's ever been, I wrote that recently, if there's ever been a moment in world history when we really could put forward a comparative history of all civilizations and of human history, that would be now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I mean, that's interesting. Perhaps these these thinkers. Well, I imagine these thinkers will come back in in our discussion. But it's interesting what you say about you know now is now is would be a great time for this uh, form of studying world history in terms of sort of an evolving of civilizations and parallels of civilizations. Um, and I guess postmodern culture doesn't really adhere to that in this sort of deconstructive everything within its own context narrative it doesn't allow for this expansive world view and um you know just for this first sort of question which is you know meant to be perhaps an overview of decline of the west um and spengler's reasons for writing it but perhaps that also begs the question of do you think that's the reason why decline of the west is still seen as this sort of scary book right you, <laughs> that people keep at arm's length um and i i generally would understand that i mean of course when we talk about volume two we might see the reasons why that is within our currently predominantly liberal culture but i when people sort of keep this book at arm's length it says to me they probably haven't read it because it's not what they expect it to be but do you think that's some of the reasons why perhaps um dr Kalana in the west hasn't really uh taken root mm -hmm. yeah most mo mo most certainly there are a couple of reasons. Of course, the, 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 the first reason why this book seems at some moments of history so interesting and at others as something to be banished somewhere in, in, in at the, at the, the uttermost uh, end of, of, of a library or university library um, is, of course, the, the, the title of the book, The Decline of the West. That is, of course, something that seems like an interesting answer in a period of crisis and something that that seems unacceptable in a period where apparently things go well. So, of course, Spengler himself, we will certainly speak about that also later, uh, Spengler himself did not see this term of, of or this notion of decline as being a um, process that would lead to a catastrophic fin final uh, uh, um, uh, event in history. So it's not about, about the burning down of the Western civilization. It's taken over by barbarian hordes and, and everything is, is destroyed and so on. Uh, no, the term 
term uh, is is much more referring to an, to to a long term process of of, of decline uh, that is that is not necessarily spectacular in itself. We also have, of course, to 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 add to this that the, the German title, the Untergang des Abendlandes, uh, is of course quite different uh, in some in some respect because uh, Untergang does not mean decline. Untergang is a term uh, that uh, could rather be translated like the sinking. So, for example, if 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 a ship is sinking, then you call it es geht unter. That that's the Untergang of a ship. Uh, and so, of course, the title in German seems much more spectacular. Right? And people think, of course, when they read Untergang, like uh, well, the, like a, a, a punctual event. While the uh, English translation, I think, better refers to Spengler's real intention, that is, seeing that as a long-term uh, um, uh, evolution. And he said once uh, himself that uh, this this title attracted many misunderstandings, and that he also could have named the book The Fulfillment of the West, and it would have said the same. So that shows already that, that there is some form of misunderstanding with the fascination and also the, the rejection of the book. Another one is, of course, as you said, uh, ideological, because this, this vision of history as being predetermined and leading not in a predetermined way to more progress and liberalism and 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 and, and whatnot uh, in the, the sense of Fukuyama's uh, uh, the end of history, but rather uh, leading, of course, to to the end of a civilizational cycle and something that cannot be escaped and something in which a more liberal out, outlook on 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 society or history or culture is something that happens all the time in each and every civilization and then disappears also. So obviously this is something, uh, someone believing that, that liberalism is, is not only the goal of history, but its very essence cannot really accept as, as such. And then a third point, of course, explaining why Spengler is still shunned is also for more political reasons, as Spengler expected that European history would lead one way or the other to the dominance of one European nation over the others, uh, and then taking over the place that ancient Rome had in the Mediterranean Empire. And so he believed that at the end, Europe also would be unified by one uh, nation and not, not the others. And so there were, of course, two candidates for him. On the one hand, the, uh, the, the United Kingdom uh, as being, at the moment, he wrote a book, of course, at the head of an enormous world empire. Uh, which so one which was, what year did, what year was he, was this published? Or what 1918. 1918. So, uh, but it, he started to write it before the war already. Okay. But so for him, one of the contenders would be either a, a European and world domination by, 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 by the UK or at least by the Anglo-Saxon powers or as an alternative Germany. And so he hoped, of course, being from Germany, that Germany would manage somehow or the other to, to build up some form of new Roman Empire within uh, within the Western civilization. And so he has often been seen also quite, uh, uh, quite falsely, of course, as uh, someone paving the way towards Hitler. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and national socialism, even though, of course, this form of basic national patriotism that is wanting that rather one's own nation than another nation takes over this place that seems predetermined in, in world history um, is not so original. It's not, not necessarily typic typically fascist or national socialist, but he has been viewed on, and from, from that point of view has been uh, often read then as, as, as a nationalist or, or, or uh, 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 yeah, patriot, but in a negative sense and so that explains why after the war with Germany lost the war some of these passages where he hoped for German dominated uh, Europe uh, seemed a bit out of place or quite a lot out of place and thus was rather uh, put into the context of the conservative revolution, reactionary predecessors of fascism, of Hitler. Of course, there were also other uh, elements like the fact that Spengler expected that the end of each and every civilization is marked by some form of, of, of uh, Caesarian charismatic empire. And so he thought that the days of democracy were, were numbered one way or the other. And that, for example, someone like, like Mussolini were the first, um, hints of 
something that would be to come, not necessarily in the 20th century, but essentially in the, the 21st century. And so he developed quite some, some you could say, some, some sympathies for, for Mussolini saying, well, that is the unavoidable fate of history, that sooner or later that kind of character will take over. Uh, and of course, after the war also, that has been seen as being uh, deeply, uh, deeply suspicious. So all that explains a little bit why, why it's still difficult to speak about Spengler, uh, even more so as you, 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 you already spoke about that. The, the, the volume is, of course, quite, quite bulky. So it's not something just to read on your usual train travel or commuting from home to, to the working place. It's very complex. It's, uh, it's not a very systematic book also. It goes into many different, different, different ways and is not at all, uh, as you would expect from the title, a systematic comparison of civilization, but rather an examination under a variety of different angles. It's rather a fragment than a systematic treatment of that subject. And I think that is also something that many readers might have discovered when they started to read the book and then didn't necessarily continue because it didn't fulfill their expectations. Mm, okay. Okay. So in relation to what you said about sort of um, the inevitability of voices such as, let's say, you know, take the, take the two most controversial examples, Hitler and Mussolini as being these inevitable, uh, almost last gasps of civilization in a sense. Is there, you know, I guess the question is what for Spengler is history, but equally, you know, one of the few things I guess people commonly do know about Spengler is that he understands history as a cycle. Is there a clear cycle for Spengler or is it fairly, you know, is it, uh, you know, something different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's, let's perhaps just, just, just state the fact that as, as much as, as uh, Spengler considered uh, Mussolini as someone, um, that uh, was a first hint of some form of Caesarism to come uh, as much he, he despised Hitler. So for him, Hitler was, was not that kind of guy. He, he, he uh, spoke about him and wrote about him in a very disparaging way in his, in his letters, his correspondence, even in 1933 published an essay uh, that is one of the first anti-national socialist essays because of course for Spengler, uh, who uh, um, uh, put forward the absolute um, parallel and th thus equality between all world civilizations from such a point of view could not, of course, at all accept the, the, the racial theory uh, uh, of the national socialists who pretended, of course, that one civilization or one race was superior to the other. Whereas for Spengler, all civilizations were rigorously symmetrical and uh, and on on an equal equal footing, of course, that ex that explains also the clashes that happened between thirty three and Spengler's death in thirty six between him and his defenders on the one hand and national socialist propagandists on the other, who at the end even uh, formally uh, put on a ban on any uh, uh, any uh, um, uh, quotation of his name in the contemporary press because he he was he became a persona non grata who was discovered as being ideologically too much opposed to, to, to this national socialism. They're just, ju just a part, but it already leads, of course, to, 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 to your, to your real question. That is, uh, to what degree is this system really determinist? And in, in, indeed it, it is. So for Spengler there, there is no way to, to escape the, the, the basic law of history, which fallen to Spengler, um, is the fact that uh, the the history of civilization, uh, or the history of each and every civilization, uh, behaves in an organic way. Uh, that is corresponds to the different steps and evolutionary steps of a biological entity, be it a plant, be it a human being. That is for him, every civilization has uh, its its birth, its its growing, its apogee, its its decline, its old age, and then its its fossilization. So it's not an end like this, you could say, but it's rather a slowing fossilization into some form of of post historical stage. And of course, these two moments are a bit vague in Spengler's philosophy. So he he does not really explain why precisely a civilization emerges. What's the initial Big Bang, you could say, that makes that now, after some form of preparation, a civilization starts to, to rise. And of course, to explain the relation between these 
post-civilizational, post-historical status and the real civilizational phase, that is, of course, also something that is still quite malleable in, in, in Spengler's thought. But the basic idea is that this, this evolution, this evolution, which is not entirely cyclical because it doesn't go back to the beginning and then starts over all again, but it is rather uh, like a curve where, well, at the end, uh, there, there are some similarities, of course, with the beginning, but the end is really the end. So uh, that civilization doesn't, doesn't, doesn't rise again. Once antiquity is dead or, or, or the Western civilization is dead, then it, it remains as, as such. And this history of a, of, of a civilization for Spengler spans over a thousand year, more or less. It's not about numerological considerations, just vaguely a millennium, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less, and is uh, differentiated into a series of phases uh, and stages corresponding to the evolution of, as I said, a plant or, or human being. And as this applies to all civilizations, that makes it possible, of course, to see where different moments in the history of civilizations are, are identical or parallel, not because they happen at the same absolute time, but at the same relative time within the development of each of these uh, civilizations. And that makes it possible, of course, for, 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 for Spengler to predict history, because as he says, if you know exactly how civilization uh, evolve uh, thanks to eight uh, examples and thanks to the biological uh, analogy, then it is possible, of course, to extrapolate this knowledge, to project it onto another, uh, not yet that civilization, and more or less predict its evolution. Of course, these, these predictions are not, are not um, specific, uh, precise, uh, quantifiable uh, predictions. So it's, it's not a mathematical model where you could calculate things and it's not like, like economic models where you can more or less add, subtract, multiply certain things and then end up with, with a, with a precise, uh, number somehow. Uh, it's rather that you can predict the, the vague, uh, the vague future of a civilization exactly, uh, in the same manner as if you have observed how you, how, how eight or nine human beings have evolved throughout their living, you can predict with some uh, credibility or with some probability how old age and death look like, and most of all, of course, that they seem uh, inevitable. So that is about that kind of more, you could say, more, more biological uh, pre prediction. And these eight or, or nine civilizations, he's a little bit unsure about that, uh, are uh, in their very chronological order, of course, ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient China, ancient India. Then you have what is called classic, you have classical antiquity. You have what is called the, the oriental civilization that is more or less uh, dominated by Christianity and Islam in the eastern half of the Mediterranean during the first millennium. Then you have Western civilization. You have uh, what uh, Spengler uh, calls uh, the Mesoamerican civilization. He was not yet really aware about the South Americans, like, like the Incas, but he, he quite well had some ideas about the Maya and the, and the Aztecs. And then, of course, he, he, he thought that perhaps there might be a ninth uh, civilization emerging, uh, soon in the future somewhere in, in Russia. So he thought that Russia might perhaps be a new form of civilization, but he sometimes changed his, his mind about all that. But, um, that was one of his, his, his expectations, whereas the West was doomed to to its end uh, quite soon, somewhere around the twenty first uh, century. Okay, okay. I mean, that's that's very interesting because you 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 say about how you know history being this sort of wave uh, upon which once something's dead, we can't. Once antiquity is dead, once classical antiquity is dead, we can't just go back. And yet, that seems to sort of be have been a has have been attempted by multiple people throughout history this this attempt at revival this attempt at sort of traditionalist revival uh this idea that sort of uh, i guess sort of um a very diehard conservatism where you actually literally go back reactionaries um etc you know multiple attempts to do this and spengler actually emphasizes the idea that you know to take the the, the examples i've gave, given are the greeks and the romans that 
for instance, if we were to take the two terms freedom or republic, right now, we simply would not be able to ever really understand the context that they would have been speaking about them, even with all the historical documentation we have. Is that seen by Spengler as us almost trying to lit- quite literally resurrect something and we're really uh, sort of poking a dead body and we're <laughs> just never going to be able to do it? Yeah. Yeah, of course, on the one hand, uh, the, the, one of the reasons might be, of course, that these, these past civilizations are, are dead somehow and uh, uh, are, are not accessible uh, uh, immediately. But uh, the, the other reason is, of course, that for Spengler, um, these civilizations cannot really communicate with each other. As for Spengler, every civilization... Uh, is based on a very specific and unique outlook uh, on on life on itself something spengler calls the seelenbild so the the soul image which is some form of you could say nearly union archetype that a civilization that is at, at the root of every civilization and that then uh, uh, shapes the way this civilization sees God, nature, politics, mathematics, culture, uh, whatever. And these different uh, approaches uh, are not um, compa- compatible with each other. And they are so fundamentally strange to each other that you cannot uh, ever really understand them from the within. Of course, uh, people then have, have criticized Spengler saying, well, if everything is somehow relative and this civilization can't, com- can't communicate, how, how, how does it come that, that you can understand them and that you write all these 1,200 pages about them? But that would be a, a, a false, I would say, a false uh, a contradiction as he, he never says that we, we can not n- never know anything about them but he says we can never really feel them as fully from within as a human being from that period and so of course we can try to to approach uh, ourselves we can of course read their literature see their 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 art try to understand their history and so of course there is some form of approach but it will never be a possibility of feeling it right from 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 the within i often see the analogy also with today's situation of 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 modern language i mean if you start at 30 something to learn to learn chinese for example and to really want to become a chinese or understand chinese civilization that's that's not something you you manage in two or three years that is something that takes up nearly a lifetime and even then, and even if you live in the middle of China, there will still be things where you know, okay, I see that as a Westerner, and even if I try to think in Chinese and just act within that, there will be some last remnant that is perhaps not entirely accessible. And if that is already the case today, then it is sure that trying to really understand how an ancient Greek of the 5th century BC fell from within is, is absolutely impossible. And so that doesn't mean, of course, that there is not any any continuity from a material sense between these civilizations. As for example, uh, it is it is obvious that that uh, especially the Western civilization, but also the Muslim civilization, have always tried to to somehow go back to antiquity, read Plato, read Aristotle, copy ancient monuments, be more or less interested in the genesis of the of the empire, of the Roman Empire, for example. But Spengler would say that all these endeavors are more superficial, uh, uh, superficial uh, attempts and uh, finally resemble uh, not a real inner understanding, but rather the way that primitive civilizations use a spolia from, uh, from, from ancient civilization. That is ruins that are lying around where you do not really know uh, what was the use of that part of a building or the other, but you just take the material together and something looks quite nice and you put that, uh, put some one on the other, and then you have a column, even if you use perhaps the, the uh, um, how you call it in English, uh, on top, the capital, the, the chap, chap, no, the, uh, the um, upper part of a, <laughs> don't find the English word, like a Corinthian capital. Um... I'm trying find. to think. You mean you mean, I guess on the, 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 on Orthodox churches it would be like the Golden Dome. Uh, yeah. Well, I meant the one 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 second. It's called 
the the capital yeah exactly okay. the, the, like the corinthian capital or doric capital or ionian capital on top of a column and is like like some examples where in the in the middle ages people found these 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 corinthian capitals and they just turned them upside down and they used them as base of a, of a of a new column or perhaps a, as a as a baptismal font for example so th- this kind of of use of as uh, of of ancient history of the past is some form of spolia where you do not really understand what these things meant but you try somehow to understand them from your own perspective you select them and then you build up some elements of your own th- civilizations thanks to 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 them that is how spengler sees the interrelations between uh, successive and contemporary uh, uh, civilizations. And that is how he explains that in the end, we will never be able to, from a Western perspective, to understand them because they have their very different outlook. Outlook like, uh, uh, for example, that the the Apollinian man uh, sees uh, the Greek uh, Roman man sees uh, sees the culture essentially uh, as 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 a combination of bodies. So he sees the outward physical bodily form in everything, whereas a, a Western Faustian man rather sees everything as a function, as something tending to something other. But you can go into that, of course, uh, later in uh, in in more detail. Okay, okay. So it's sort of, there is a, quite surprisingly, it seems, there is a cultural relativity for Spengler, but it's equally connected to, you know, as I I said in the questions on page 54, he says there's no eternal truths, but it seems there are culturally contextual truths, which you have to understand in relation to how they then alter what they sort of subsume into their culture. So a culture's understanding of history equally has its own truths, which it then you know, uses to alter how it understands history. So you can never really get to, well, there never is going to be a truth. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's one of the, I would say, tricky tricky parts of, um, of, of Spengler's philosophy and also where I somehow tried to understand him, perhaps tried to put him in a way that would make it more, more understandable from my point of view and, and why I'm also trying my own endeavors to develop my, my own philosophy of history to somehow add some new uh, elements to it. But to it because Spengler was, was deeply committed to the, the philosophical school called uh, vitalism, vitalism mm-hmm. uh, very present in the 19th century, uh, somehow goes back already to, to Goethe and then you can draw some lines of continuity through Schopenhauer and Nietzsche towards Simmel and all these thinkers were were convinced in the fact that the ultimate principle of or, or that there was some form of dichotomy rather between on the one hand what is unorganic purely material logical but somehow dead mm-hmm. and then that there is something that is that is uh, that is living that is natural that is evolving that has of course it's it's beginning and it's end somehow and that does not only apply of course to individual bodily entities but also to civilizations and so that that's more or less the somewhat dualistic background of of Spengler's philosophy of history and so for him the principle of, of for him life in itself is some form of of ultimate principle that is not necessarily a transcendent principle that but that is one of the basic forms of 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 existing and that has a law of its own the law of organicity as opposed to the law of what is unorganic. That is somehow the ultimate, can't really call it metaphysical base, even though it is some form of metaphysics, of, of, of Spengler's thought. And, and of course, uh, if in, in that look of history, um, there cannot be any transcendence goal or objective. There is no God or at least no God with any relation to the individual. There's the only form of transcendence is that we as human beings somehow, uh, somehow are also shaped by this, by this law of, of, of life exactly as a civilization. And so the only criterion that you have for assessing, judging, uh, uh, comparing civilizations is essentially aesthetical. So you cannot say there is good or bad in history. You, you just have things that correspond 
to the principle of life or which are opposed things that are strong or that are weak somehow but there is not necessarily good or bad in the metaphysical transcendence sense and there is also no necessarily no necessary belief in in the afterlife of a soul or the existence of abstract principles and so on so all that is missing in spengler's philosophy as it is missing in in, in most of 19th century vitalist uh, philosophy that is <coughs> at the root of of this problem also that is can we learn from history and most of all is there any any absolute truth and of course spengler could say well the life is a form of truth perhaps even some form of metaphysical truth is your want to put it like that. And so that civilizations evolve in a, in a vitalist form um, is certainly a form of absolute truth. It is not a relativist truth, but that these civilizations develop certain forms of thought, be it rationality, be it uh, scholasticism, be it mysticism, cynicism, or so on and so forth. Well, there he would say, well, all that is relative. All that can only be understood from an aesthetical point of view as belonging to this or that step in the history of every civilization. But it is not absolutely truth from, from, a, from a metaphysical perspective. So that is more or less how he tries to, to understand all that. And of course, there is, there is a certain self-contradiction in there. If you, if you want this, finally... Um, Spengler never really speaks about the transcendent function of the Seelenbilder, that is, these ultimate viewpoints on culture, gods, men, whatever, that is at the heart of, of, of every civilization. He sees that from an aesthetic point of view, but he never really tries to show, as, as he could have done, finally, to show to what extent these different approaches towards uh, something that is absolute um, are complementary, are contradicting, somehow refer to the fact that all believe nevertheless in one absolute transcendent entity. So there are a lot of things Spengler could have done with his philosophy of history, which, which he didn't. So this philosophy of history is, I think, open towards perhaps a more idealistic interpretation. There is, of course, this vitalist substrat, but it is not exclusively vitalist. And so I'm convinced, so I've tried also in a couple of paper or books, to show that you can even have a, a, an idealistic, even a Hegelian reading of Spengler without having to reject all, all of that. You can take the same material as Spengler, put away this somewhat extreme relativism he sometimes put forth and show that, well, that is perhaps something where Spengler can be proved on without infirming his entire theory through that kind of more creative um, dealing with the uh, morphology, morphology of history. So, so what role did, so was Spengler an atheist? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> he never, I, 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 he's never explicit. I, I, no, but uh, yes, yes. Well, he he said somehow. I I remember that. I'm not sure if it's in his in his posthumously published uh, recollections, which are not quite long, but which are from the time where he wrote the decline of, of the West, or if it's from his correspondence. But there's a, a passage somehow where he says that all his spiritual uncertainties and inner fights and so on were resolved when he was already. 15 or 16, can't remember exactly. But that must have been the age where he, despite or because of his extremely religious upbringing in a, in a Protestant environment, somehow rejected all that. So I'm, I'm not sure if he would have said, I'm an atheist and a materialist, because for him, materialism is also a very specific phase in the history of each civilization. And he criticized, of course, materialism for its for its its shortcomings somehow. Uh, I mean, he even deplores the end of religion and once says that a religion that arrives at just dealing with social problems has ceased even to be to be religion. So for for him there is certainly a meta meta perspective beyond materialism or atheism. Uh, but I think that what others would then call God or something is for him rather the belief in this 
this principle <coughs> this principle of life that somehow is obviously transcending pure matter as pure matter would be unorganic whereas this life as a principle gives it some form of uh, of evolution um, but it it goes not mu- goes not much more beyond that and in the entire decline um, there is no no endeavor to to go more through to this uh, metaphysical uh, issues even in his posthumously edited fragments called urfragen primordial questions uh, he, he turns around these kinds of principles but it it remains fixed in this dichotomy matter versus life but this life is never a truly a truly rational transcendent uh, a principle as it would be in an idealistical uh, fi- fi- philosophy it is it is neither subordinated uh, to 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 pure matter it is just another another principle you could say that explains through its dualistic uh, uh, interaction how life re- evolves but in the end it 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 remains somehow somehow dualistic and without sense because spengler also in one very well known passage says that finally uh history has no sense so there is no metaphysical sense beyond it all it's all it is just something you can look at admire from an aesthetical perspective that is beautiful so for him the beauty of something is an existing category but it is nothing that has a any form of metaphysical or, or moral or, or teleological sense subspecie eternitatis if you if you wish mm-hmm. so let's say spiritual uh, mar- <coughs> markers or, or symbols or I don't know what, how to say them but spiritual factors such as God such as souls such as our understanding of souls such as our understanding of scripture this for Spengler would be removed from the purely spiritual understanding and understood within that historical framework so you'll know that 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 is really is that is that a common criticism of Spengler that he's sort of removing things from their own context and thereby applying them to his own sort of Spenglerian world history view? Well, I would say that in the reception of Spengler, that there has been, of course, a a, a very negative reception of, of of him from the side of uh, theologians, of of theological authors and and academics, but not necessarily because of his own atheism and endeavor to somehow relativize. The entire history in order to put it into his system. The criticism, of course, of the uh, theologians was rather about his view about Christianity not being a unique phenomenon in, in, in history, but rather uh, being uh, or belonging to what he called the Oriental uh, civilization. That is, uh, and he one, in one passage also uh, clearly states it, that in fact, Islam and early Christianity belong to the same civilization and that Christianity has developed in the Western civilization that is since the Carolingian or Ottonian reform, so around the, the year 800 or, or, or 1000, that this Christianity is utterly different. It takes over, obviously, books, cults, rituals, uh, hierarchies, and so forth, but fills it with a very different spirit. And at one place, he even says concretely that finally, Jesus is much nearer to Islam than to, to, to today's Islam, than to today's Western Christianity, because it belongs to, to this civilization. So mm-hmm. that is, of course, something that was not necessarily very much appreciated by the, the theological <laughs> colleagues of, uh, of, uh, of, of Spengler. So he was criticized for that. But apart from that, his, his own... Just, just out of interest, is he speaking uh, there uh, it's like civilizationally, or is he speaking... Perhaps it's my own bias. Is he speaking of Protestantism? About? Uh, Protestantism. Prot- ah, Protestantism. Uh, no, it's really civilizational. So he mm-hmm. says Jesus involves, uh, evolves uh, within the same worldview as Islam later. He belongs to the same world. Jesus is nearer somehow to the imagination of the Thousand and One Nights mm-hmm. than to the to Western, be it Catholicism, be it Protestantism. So he doesn't make a big difference also between 
Catholicism and Protestantism, for him, just Protestantism is a further phase, you could say, of, of Catholicism that, that, that translates Catholicism into a more rationalist, uh, abstract background. So it's in, in some way also a form of decline, if you wish, of, of Christianity, if you see its Catholic beginning at its, at its real beginning or highlight. But uh, that is, of course, the teleological Protestant perspective that is that is speaking there as Protestantism somehow, how, somehow putting Catholicism or Christianity on a new level in comparison to Catholicism. So that is certainly his his uh, his individual uh, uh, bias. But in order to come back to the, the question about the criticism, so he, he has not necessarily been criticized because of his more atheist or vitalist outlook on history. That was quite common in the 1920s. I mean, everyone was Nietzschean in, in some way or the other. And so those at least who even even condescended to to discuss uh, the decline of the West generally had had much more problems with his 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 uh, determinism and the way he somewhat creatively also reinterpreted certain phases in history so that it matched uh, together and of course with individual errors of his book than with the rest but I think what is also perhaps very um, relevant about that question is that the first volume of the decline of the West, which has been published in 1918, so just at the end of the war, uh, um, uh, a bit before the end of the war, even when Spengler even still hoped for, for German victory in the, in the First World War, that this first volume, uh, which is more about mathematics, arts, philosophy, and so forth, and not yet necessarily about political uh, 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 issues, was discussed in a quite large fashion in the contemporary acad academic world, whereas the second volume, which is, I would say, more, uh, much more to the point and uh, which really interprets contemporary Western history in view of all this and which is very, which, which can seem very provocative, was much less discussed because obviously it seemed too political not academic enough. And so the, the, the volume that may seem today the, the more boring of the two was the one that was better accepted by the academic colleagues than the second one, which is, I think, much deeper as it really delves into political analogies, but which was considered as being too politically engaged and perhaps also dangerous by, by the contemporaries. Also, have, of course, to say that in 1918, there was a huge disorientation, even of the academic world in, in Germany after the war, which was lost at the upheavals of the uh, Versailles Treaty and the by beginnings of the Weimar Republic. Whereas in 1922, when the second volume appeared, the Weimar Republic had settled down, democracy was somehow confirmed, you could say, much more than in 1918. And so Spengler's quite... Uh, critical remarks towards Weimar and towards modern liberalism seemed, of course, a bit too dangerous so that many colleagues didn't even start to discuss the second volume because it seemed somehow to discredit itself because of its political uh, bias. Okay, okay. That's un okay. That's understandable within that historical context, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, an another um, German figure along sort of the Spenglerian vitalist line that... Uh, I, we've I've discussed on the show before. Ludwig Klagers was, you know, also also someone who uh, work was ignored basically for those very same reasons that it just fell fell at the wrong time, and has eventually meant that he's misconstrued in that same manner of really nothing to do with uh, Nazism or fascism, but he would just happen to be at that time. So it's unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's of course a style of this period also. Uh, a fashion to write that somehow belongs, of course, to this same mind mindset of the 1920s, 1930s, a very bombastic approach towards style, a very uh, speaking much about fate, about the soul, about destiny, about uh, the, 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 the essence of peoples and so on. And of, of course, that seems from 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 a present point of view, very old, not only old fashioned, but also somehow politically fraught and, and uh, uh, too much connected also to the same vocabulary that was, of course, used then by, 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 by the conservative revolution. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Okay. So you mentioned at the beginning that you wrote uh, a paper or a couple of papers on comparing the the fall of the Roman em- Roman Empire to, to contemporary understanding of the EU. But this was you say this this was like a Hegelian reading of Spengler in this. Yeah, well, there, there, there is on the one hand this, 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 this book. I think that's the that's the German 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 version uh, on the path towards empires. It seems a bit a bit cheesy, but uh, this idea of of a comparison between the late Roman Republic and and present day present day West that was not necessarily a philosophical book. Of course, there there there, there was the, there were these basic assumptions of cultural comparatism below it, but I didn't really put that too much into that framework because it was rather about really concrete analogies between 21st century AD and the first century BC. But I wrote also a couple of papers which have also recently been been published in my in my 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 this year's uh, book on Oswald Spengler, which I which is a collection of of, of papers I I published of my papers which I published some some months ago and there are indeed uh, reunited uh, the different papers where I tried to 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 present some form of combination between Hegel between the Hegelian ternary dialectical approach towards history and Spengler's idea that all civilizations are are equal and parallel and basically on the one hand I show that Hegel's idea that history with a the human history as such evolves in three stages that it that is the, the old orient the ancient orient where just one man was free that is the despot the, the classical antiquity where some were free that is greek and roman antiquity and then the modern west since the middle ages where all are free uh, and where each of these phases is also subdivided uh, into different stages uh, does not necessarily correspond to to reality because of course this um, this 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 vision ancient orient classical antiquity modern west is, is a very old fashioned and and uh, world of view of the world which does not correspond at all to the the, the inner differences between what is called the or, or ancient orient and not not at all also to the reality of 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 classical antiquity but also that the recent evolution of the west seems to show that not everything is tending towards the absolute freedom of everyone and the triumph of of freedom and democracy and constitutionalism but that there are dark uh, there are clouds on the horizons and that finally we should go back to hegel's own endeavor to read uh, each one or every one of these components uh, or what he called Volksgeister, that is the, the evolution of a different, of a, of a specific people uh, in a dialectical way. Because if you, if you read Hegel, you see that his, his ternary dialectical uh, model is not only applied to world history, but also to, to every civilization somehow in itself. He also says that history somehow is a is a circle of circles. So all elements within this behave as their own cyclical elements. And it is obvious also in Hegel that uh, there is no real optimism that at the end of each one of these little historical entities, these entities are evolving to a better step, to, to a higher step, but rather end themselves. So he shows quite clearly how, how the Roman Empire is the end point of classical antiquity and is not is not better than the rest, but rather somehow 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 an ending point behind which there there cannot be any any form of continuity. And so there are quite a lot of metaphysical elements in Hegel's philosophy of history, which seem much more uh, much more Spenglerian than 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 you would think, and so I tried to mix and match and somehow the two to take over this dialectical approach towards history, but basically not to see it as a progress, but rather as some form of curve or cycle, and to apply it not to world history but to different civilizations and. Then this matches very well to Spengler's categories and makes it possible to use basically the, the, the basic assumptions of German idealism in order to make the evolution of every uh, civilization not just an aesthetical phenomenon, but something that is necessary, that is logically necessary, and that is somehow replaying 
a, a ternary dialectical structure that is that is typical for not just for history, but for logical thought, for 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 uh, um, uh, all forms of uh, of, 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 of 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 real uh, phenomena. So this mm. this in short. Uh, the, uh, the 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 core of this uh, this attempt, which is then uh, tried, which is then proposed or shown to to apply to the Iranian civilization, the Western civilization, the ancient civilization, and it, it functions it functions quite well. I, I dare say, at least my point of view. Okay. Okay. So, as as perhaps as a good final final question, because I think people will probably be dying to know, you know, going off the off of your own book there and your own work and this Benglarian analysis where do you where do you see contemporary western civilization can we use spengler to say here's roughly where we are you know what what does our cycle look like and whereabouts in it are we mm -hmm. Yeah, well, for, from a purely political point of view for spengler or from a biological point of view we are um, somewhere at the beginning of the winter of the old age of Western civilization, which is marked on the one hand by, because for, for Spengler, of course, there is, these entities are called Kulturen, cultures, whose last stage only is called civilization, civilization. So he makes, he makes a difference which we not, do not necessarily generally make when we speak like today, but for him, Civilization is a very specific term that just applies to the end of the history of a culture, of a culture. And so for him, civilization starts more or less with the French Revolution and with mm -hmm. Napoleon, exactly like in antiquity it starts with Alexander the Great, for example. And so it's, it's uh, the history of modernity that corresponds more or less to the history of Hellenism in classical antiquity. And mm -hmm. now we are more or less at the end of that, that is, we are more or less where the late Roman Republic is is situated within the ancient uh, civilization, and so <coughs> this is a time where real creative impetus has has died out more or less. Everything that is left over is just quantity, is the possibility of expansion, but not of a qualitative bettering or, or evolution so we are already in this this very unorganic logic somehow or we can expand we can build up we can ac accumulate but we will not be really able to create something that is fundamentally new that is also why we focus essentially on on technical uh, progress, on democracy as being also a division of society into equal parts and not into qualitatively different parts. That is why our period is a period of imperialism, of globalism, uh, uh, of materialism, of consumerism. All that, Spengler would say, is typical for late civilization. It would also mark the end of the uh, greek roman civilization. And that leads to the fact that from a political point of view, um, we are now during the last stages of the triumph of what is uh, for Spengler the, the ultra liberal plutocratic system where democracy has more or less been uh, parasited by a purely capitalist, ultra, ultra capitalist outlook on economy. So democracy or remains of democracy is just some form of smokescreen that is hiding the fact that it is the big corporations who, who decide about everything, uh, whereas the people is more or less manipulated through money by the media, mass media and so forth. That's what he already in 1918, 1920, 22 uh, predicted for, for, for the 21st century. And so th this evolution then leads following to Spengler in our age uh, to the rise of Caesarism. Caesarism as some form of, 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 of uh, reaction to that where um, the, the people are so disconnected uh, from this polarizing system that they want to overthrow one way or the other this dictatorship of money and replace it by some form of more political, archaical dictatorship. And that is why they, they, they give rise to a ser series of, of Caesars that is some form of, you could say, populist uh, tribunes of the people trying to protect the people and fight against big money. 
uh, people like uh, like uh, Catilina, like uh, Claudius, like Marius in, in classical antiquity. Today, of course, there are also quite a number of people you could name. I'm sure that Spengler would have would have a lot of pleasure uh, in in uh, studying Donald Trump, for example, as being one of these proto Caesarist uh, or at least uh, a tribunesque uh, uh, people like Trump and, and Catilina, for example. That's a, a, a very very interesting comparison. I also wrote some papers on that. And so these 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 Caesarist personalities will then more and more also accumulate power in the form not of money but of popular support and of support by army police force or paramilitary uh, institutions and then one way or the other overthrow these uh, these uh, ultra capitalist uh, uh, system uh, while being while establishing more and more some form of symbiosis with it in order to get things run uh, and so that leads then after the caesarist phase to what could be called the Augustan phase, that is to uh, to some form of definitive final empire um, that is strictly hierarchical, where you of course have the empire, but you also have uh, big money and big elite players somehow as, as some form of new aristocracy, but whose whose well being depends of course on the ascendant of the ruler. Uh, who is based essentially on the army and on the people. And this then uh, creates some, some final form of government that does not really evolve much further from there, that just perhaps becomes a bit more simple and primitive and where all the ancient forms of refinement disappear uh, in, in order to make place to a very crude form of military monarchy, which becomes then more and more barbarian, you could say, and less and, and, and even less creative than everything that was before, until it is one way or the other blown away by its internal dissensions, by, by outward uh, influences, by natural catastrophes, who knows? So once this Augustan empire, you could say, is established, and for Spengler, that is something that would happen now during the next one or two generations. From that moment on, a civilization becomes totally, our civilization would then become totally petrified and uh, would cease to, to evolve really, really much more uh, than, uh, uh, much more than, 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 than what happened now, uh, and be more or less in analogy with the, uh, with the Roman, uh, empire. Do you, do you personally agree that we, uh, that's, that's, do you see that happening? Yeah. Where which yeah. which markers do you see as the this Augustine type form of governance? Who do you uh, see, who do you see as being uh, you know if you're happy to speak about it? Who do you see as being <laughs> the the figureheads of that? Yeah. Well, that is something, of course, that will just happen in a generation or so. So for the moment, the the big question first is when and how will liberal democracy or what is considered still as liberal democracy be more and more <clears throat> put aside by more uh, Caesarist uh, movements. And that seems, of course, very present a bit everywhere where uh, liberal democracy is is questioned by what is called today very often populism uh, or by authoritarian movements, but also from the within uh, by, by strong monopolies where you already see now that some corporations or some individuals accumulate much more power in their hands than, for example, certain presidents or, or prime ministers. And so the, the, the erosion of what remains, at least on a formal point of view, what remains of, of, of liberal democracy, uh, becomes, of course, obvious, not only in the last, in the last years, but, but of course, now with the COVID crisis, where, uh, it seems more and more, more and more obvious that uh, fears of seeing our liberty rights uh, um, durably uh, removed or, or conditioned by certain forms of well-behavior uh, becomes an everyday reality for many people and won't go away also as, 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 I, as, I, as I fear very often. So I've, 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 but of course that, that, that's not all. That is just, just one symptom. There are of course many other symptoms which were at the, 
at the at the root of my book uh, uh, of the Vegans Imperium, which sadly has has never been translated into English now into quite a lot of other European languages. And so the the the, the other markers, like for example the decline of the classical family, the decline of demography also, the disappearance of classical religion, uh, globalization, for example, as parallel to, to romanization. Uh, social polarization is also an indicator. The fact also that, um, that uh, political elites tend to become more and more closed upon themselves and do not necessarily react anymore very much with their, with their electorate. Uh, the, the, uh, also the rise of international institutions that take over power from previously uh, national democratic uh, uh, institutions. Asymmetric wars, that's also something very typical for, for the late Republic. Mass immigration and multiculturalism is also something that is typical for the last stage of a civilization, essentially, of the uh, Greco, Greco-Roman world. Uh, and then, of course, we have things like, like the rise of, of, of populism, like popular contestation, uh, like uh, also... Um, uh, this, this, um, uh, uh, could you say, uh, um, uh, not Caesarist, but uh, um, a demagogic approach of populist movements towards power because they do not necessarily have a response. They just contest something and thrive on this this form of, of contest without any positive problem because there is no real solution to that issue. And so um, there, there are quite a, a lot of these different elements which taken together uh, point very strongly to an alleged analogy between this late Roman Republic and, and, and the present. And so for me, as, as, as for Spengler, obviously, to whom I'm much, much indebted in this, uh, the outcome seems, seems inevitable. That is some form of, of, of large scale and endemic political unrest, like in the, like we see already in France through the Yellow Wests or in, in, in the US with the Black Lives Matters as being some, some first form of manifestation of this endemic form of insecurity and, and unrest. And thus, uh, the, uh, an impending economic decline also that will necessarily follow and that will lead sooner or later to the emergence of these uh, Caesarist, uh, individuals. For the moment, people like, for example, Joe Biden or like Macron correspond very clearly to someone like uh, Pompeius uh, in the late Roman Republic who tried for, for the last time somehow to fit together this ancient senatorial system and somehow defend it uh, against any any form of populist or, or, or Caesarist menace. But on the long term, um, this attempt can only function through, through cruder and more brutal ways until, in the end, there is some form of real political dissociation and, and, and open uh, forms of contestation that then, in the end, in 10, 20 years or so, could give rise then not only to modern forms of Caesarism, but also of, of, of the pseudo Augustan regime. And if we want to look how, how such a, a, a Western principate could look like, it suffices to look at modern Russia, where you already see, of course, in, 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 in Putin, someone who, like Augustus on the outwards, gives a protect a certain facade of republicanism, of constitutionalism, of elections, which still happen some form of of, of, of pseudo-democratic structures. But in the end, of course, all this is based on one strongman who controls essentially the, the army and who is popular with the people in order to keep at bay somehow these, these oligarchs on which this system is nevertheless based, based. So there are quite a lot already of, of elements of an Augustan principate in modern day Russia. That is also something like this that I would expect to to happen uh, during the next generation in in the Western world. Wow, that's uh, well. I guess it, it's dependent on how how you look at it and where you are and who you're with. It's whether or not that's uh, pessimistic. But I guess for most people, it's going to be a bit of a shock. Yeah. Is is there anything you you'd like to add about uh, this this first volume that you feel we we haven't covered? Um, well, perhaps. Perhaps the, the thing that, that I find to be the most interesting in Spain, of course, there are these, 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 this, this outlook on our future, which may seem quite bleak or pessimist, as you, as you, as you stated. And indeed, it 
does not necessarily gives uh, give us any any hope in a new Renaissance, a new Baroque, a new cultural apogee, and so forth. So that is of course um, something for which Spengler has very often been, or he has been very often been limited to to this this perspective, which is of course obviously already present in in the the title of his book, but. Uh, my interest in Spengler goes not necessarily to 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 what he announces or predicts as as our being our future, but I find him to be the the, the most interesting in in showing how all these great civilizations behave and how they they evolve in in a very similar way, and this 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 makes it possible for us and at least it was for me a very enriching example of. Uh, um, having a, a, a very unique approach to the inner understanding of other civilizations in saying, aha, this is a phase that corresponds broadly to our feudalism or that is their renaissance or this is their Alexander, for example. And that, that makes suddenly, that makes sense. Very often when, when I study other civilizations, these, these hints, these Spenglerian perspectives give sense and makes it possible to, to read and understand the sources and, and, and artifacts, works of art and so on with a, with a totally new light. It makes it more easier for us to, to understand them from the within. Uh, and somehow also to to fill in many gaps in our documentation, because if you look at, for example, the ancient southeastern South South South, South Asian world, or, or ancient Egypt, or or, or uh, the Mesoamerican world, we have we have enormous lacunae in our knowledge about them, and that is very sad to see. Okay, we have 100, 200 years, and no idea what happened in just one moment, and then. Another, what was in between, and this this morphological reading of, of of history makes it possible to to supply quite a lot of elements we do not precisely know about, but which we can suppose to be quite probable to to have happened, and that makes it also possible to see some single events, sources, notes in a very specific light. And uh, for me, that has been very very interesting as a as a as a, as a person, as someone who is deeply curious not necessarily about our future but also about our our common past uh, to 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 understand them from the within i think that spengler's theory makes it much easier than than all other uh, previous attempts to to feel what mu what must have happened how these these civilizations evolve and through this better understanding also to see um, what makes them unique uh, what is the specific approach towards the absolute towards the transcendence and even though we will never fully understand them from the within as Spengler rightly rightly says at least it it opens opens a way to see, okay, they saw the world like that, they, they did that, they did that. And if you put all that together, these different conflicting, sometimes perhaps even contradicting worldviews, you get a fairly good example uh, or overview over what humanity as such has has evolved, over these different outlooks, how, how God was viewed, how the world is viewed. And if you believe, as I do, uh, that there is indeed something that is an absolute truth, that is also truth, that is beauty, that is the good, then you come to the approach that all these civilizations, they have their own look on this, this absolute truth. There's all different positions, which is why they never see this absolute as, as identical. They are all somehow arranged around, if you wish, and see other facets of the same uh, uh, transcendence, but, but uh, they, they are there. And only if you think them all together, uh, you can somehow have some form of more I would say more more complete approach towards uh, towards this truth, this 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 good, this 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 beauty. Then, when you remain within your own typically Western worldview, and for me, for me, uh, Spengler paved paved the way towards this form of understanding, which is something for for which I am 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 deeply grateful to to the lecture of the decline of the West, because I, as I said, read it essentially with you. To the past, to the richness of of, of bygone uh, civilizations, and not necessarily just as as, as some one more thinker announcing uh, the end of the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you mind if I ask what uh, what is your your absolute truth? 
the you know the thing that they all sort of are coalescing around and having a perspective on that's a, that's a large question i just can 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 say that i think that this absolute truth exists that it has been called God very often, that it is not identical with the world, but somehow transcendent, that is, it is, it is, uh, the world is guaranteed through it, it is shaped through it, it is created through it, but it is not just in a pantheistic way identical with the world. It is, it is, it is, it is above it, uh, but of course, at the same time, it is reflected within us, within everything that is, that is one, that is beautiful, that is, that is good, that is, that is true somehow. It holds the world together. It is the one element that is one way or the other uh, subconsciously present in all attempts uh, or real attempts, at least, to, towards uh, religion and philosophy. Uh, and uh, I see Spengler perhaps a bit against his own position, but I see at least Spengler's system uh, as a, 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 a very practical way to, to approaching this this absolute truth uh, and to 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 free myself also from this typical Western Faustian perspective on world, but to see okay we see it like that, but the ancient Greek Romans may have another perspective, the Chinese still another one, the Muslims still another one, uh, and somehow the the real truth is is not in the addition of all that 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 would be much too 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 vulgar, but the the absolute truth is something that can emerge when we take all this together and which makes it possible for us not to have just a two two dimensional but a three dimensional approach towards this uh, this unique uh, supreme and transcendent oneness. That's very uh, very articulate way of putting it. <laughs> um, yeah, that seems like a, a, a good place to finish up. Um, so whereabouts can we find your papers and essays? And I assume your books are all available via the probably the, the German Amazon or the Germ German bookshops. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, there are quite a lot of translations also around. So some of the, 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 the listeners who are perhaps not, or viewers who are perhaps not so accustomed with German can, can also find the French translations of, of most of what I, I, I wrote, but also some other languages. So on Amazon, you should be able to find quite, uh, quite a lot of that. There are also some English books around, but there are perhaps more political issues. So, so it's quite, quite, quite easy. But of course, the, the main collection of what you could call my thought about, about, about Spengler is, is obviously this, this quite fresh book published this year. Uh, called Oswald Spengler Werk Deutung Rezeption, which is more or less where I am for 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 the moment uh, in my 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 reflection on um, on Spengler. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, David Engels, thanks very much. Thank you very much for your invitation. It was a pleasure.